Hi everybody, welcome to this edition of AusDocs. My name is Rod Friedman, I'm one of the committee members of AusDocs. I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, Rich Welch, or introduce Rich, he's, he's the gentleman at the end. Um, Rich is uh, formerly of, of many things, but the Antenna International Documentary F Film Festival, he was involved with that for a long time, and he is now head of, uh, head of documentary at the film school. And I just want to say thank you to you, Rich, because your energy and enthusiasm in cooperating and, and collaborating with AusDocs is very much appreciated. So uh, please give a big hand to Rich Welch on our panel. So, without no further ado, um, in order, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Megan Hayward from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at UTS. Megan Hayward is an educator, a creator, fusing storytelling and new technologies for interactive narrative, electronic literature, locative media, and augmented reality. She teaches digital media and interactive documentary at University of Technology at Sydney. Alyssa Orvis is investment manager at Screen Australia. Alyssa has been in the documentary development and investment manager at Screen Australia for the last five years and works across the production investment slate. She has overseen a number of online initiatives, including Arts Bites, Love Bites with ABC Arts, Doco 180 for Women, the short documentary initiative with The Guardian UK, and Pitch Australiana for Vice. Kylie Bolton, from commission editor online documentaries at SBS. Kylie is an award, a multi-award winning interactive filmmaker, a Walkley award winning journalist and producer, and a commissioning editor at SBS. Kylie is the 2019 R-Watch Fellowship recipient and engaged widely as a public speaker on innovation, culture, identity, and writing. And many of the credits include, uh, well, the most recent one is The Missing, which was the SBS interactive doc, which I think Megan might be showing a little no, clip of. No, no Maybe, okay, no, she's not. So there we go. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have Indi, Indi Ford, who's a filmmaker, marine scientist, and digital media creative. She uh, successfully pitched her documentary idea, Shooting Cats, for the inaugural Vice Pitch Australiana initiative at the AIDC in 2018. The short documentary has since attracted over a million views online and broadcast on SBS Viceland on the 24th of April in 2019. Indi currently also works as a film distributor at Studio Canal in the media um, marketing and digital area. So please give a round of applause. So just to give a little bit of context and framing before we dive in, um, online documentaries and dist online distribution has offered a huge boost for the visibility of documentaries, especially in short form docs. And has provided a pathway for indie filmmakers, both in reaching wider audiences and exploring new and innovative ways in which to tell their stories. So from traditional platforms such as New York Time Op Doc, The Guardian Documentaries and Field of Vision, um, has actually, so, some of these have actually seen Oscar-nominated directors such as Marshall Curry and Errol Morris come on to actually have short documentaries on these platforms. Um, the, one of the best areas of this is that it actually allows filmmakers to experiment in ways that probably wouldn't be uh, possible via traditional platforms. Uh, a great example of that is uh, Good Luck with the Wall, which is a field of vision one which is made from entirely a thousand of Google Map images stitched together. Uh, the online space has also provided platforms to allow for new forms of documentary, such as interactive docs. Uh, Bear, Sen Bear 71 from the NFB is probably one of the best known examples of this. Uh, SBS is the block, is a local um, example. More recently, micro docs and short media in platforms such as Instagram Stories, with Eva Stories, a teenage girl's Holocaust narrative. Um, we have 360 VR, AR, uh, such as The Guardian's uh, 6x9 virtual. Uh, virtual experience of solitary confinement and SBS is the missing which I mentioned earlier on which is an interactive documentary which shares the story of an uh, abducted schoolgirl Wendy Jane Pfeiffer and the Aboriginal trackers who brought her home um, but I thought actually sometimes it's best to use other people's words to frame things and I'm going to use Charlie Phillips who is the commission editor of the Guardian at documentaries who said on short docs these films aren't short because the makers are too experienced, inexperienced or uh, to be trusted with a longer film or because viewers will only watch short films online. They're short because it's the ideal length uh, for the stories being told and they're lean with no padding out to fill an arbitrary broadcast slot. Documentary shorts are thriving with viewers, arguably more so than longer form documentaries. Festivals are starting to increase the numbers they show. 
these small jewels deserve more attention from critics rather than being seen as a training ground for the longer form. So that seems like a wonderful segue into our first panellist. So if you can give a, a round of applause for Megan, she's going to come up to the lectern. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Hayward, and I teach uh, online documentary at UTS. And I'm going to say straight up that my focus in talking to you tonight is going to be more on the interactive side of documentary rather than just straight short form documentary that is hosted online. So just to let you know that, that that's what my focus is. So. So just to kind of fill you in a little bit, um, online documentary, you might also have heard of them as iDocs. Uh, that might be something that, that you know, interactive documentary, online documentary, the terms are still a little bit fluid. But what do we mean by online documentary or interactive documentary? So if we consider documentary as the creative treatment of actuality, which is a quote that I'm sure you're very familiar with, Grissom and Hardy, um, 79, I think it is, then, you know, what happens when we're actually starting to think about how a documentary might act, might look, might operate in a digital environment? So using digital technologies and delivered via digital platforms. So just not just thinking about taking documentary and plonking it online, but thinking about the kind of specific affordances that are to do with digital platforms. So um, drawing on digital affordances. So what do I mean by affordances? So affordance is a term uh, that refers to the perceived and actual properties of a thing. You could think about a ball is kind of made for bouncing. Lights are kind of a light switch is uh, the affordance is to kind of flick it on and off. So we're thinking about um, the way that machines or objects or platforms or devices work that actually kind of promote certain affordances, allow certain affordances in terms of using them. Okay, so thinking about this term interactive and um, trying to kind of tease out what we might mean by that. So we might be thinking about um, interactive documentary, we might be thinking about works that, that allow participation, works that are perhaps non-linear. So we might be used to working in a linear form, but actually maybe mixing that up, making works that allow users to actually navigate around in a non-linear way, in a non-sequential way. So we're thinking about non-sequentiality, non we're thinking about interactivity, we're thinking about participation. And we might be thinking about what happens to point of view. So we can have obviously multiple points of view in a traditional documentary, but um, online documentaries, interactive documentaries actually make that very possible because we can, we can actually portray multiple points of view very easily and we can allow people to move around them, navigate around them, quite well, and we might do that quite deliberately. We might want to set up um, kind of tension or, or um, you know, comparisons between different points of view. So for example, there was um, a YouTube documentary called, uh, what was it YouTube? No, it was called Gaza Stado, which actually followed the lives of two women who lived on uh, opposite sides of the Gaza Strip. So, um, so, you know, thinking about the way that point of view can be portrayed in a digital platform. But we're also perhaps thinking about this idea of immersion. So we might be thinking about immersive content. We might be thinking about responsive content, content that is responsive to uh, a user interacting with it. We might be thinking about location specific content content that is actually available via our mobile phone when we're in a location. And we can actually draw up content that is documentary content that is specific to that location. So thinking about the ways that, that this can actually impact how we think about documentary. And the other thing is liveness. So social platforms, for example, allow um, people to react in an almost live kind of manner. So instead of thinking about what we might be more used to in terms of broadcast documentary <clears throat> or a 
or a cinematic release is thinking about the way that we can actually play with time um, in digital platforms. We might also be thinking about game-like works, works that actually kind of draw upon um, game-like affordances or approaches. And in fact, SBS have kind of done a few of those. User-generated content is another area that we might be able to think about bringing in content from users, having people rate things, having people say things, having people upload their own content. We might be thinking about work that is exploratory, that is not actually necessarily kind of pushing a, a clear um, kind of narrative line through the work, but allows people to navigate around and cut their own trail through work, like, for example, the block. SBS is the block which allows you to navigate around a kind of 3D environment of uh, the block in Redfern and get access to stories of people um, within that location. And of course we might be drawing upon the social affordances of digital technologies as well. So this kind of incredible emergence of uh, social platforms which are being leveraged by uh, different uh, producers all the time and I'm going to show you a work that was launched last week that's quite an interesting one. Okay, so when I talk to my students about online documentary and it might be a little bit different from tonight, I'm not talking about just posting content online. That's not what I am encouraging students to do. So. So if we look at this quote by Dovey and Rose, our contention is that the processes of documentary production can change through new forms of collaboration and that in fact the forms of documentary are changing. Are changing through software design and interactivity and the user experience of documentary can change through the new facility for participation offered by the online environment. So that's in an ideal world, we're all getting to make work like this, we're all getting to access work like this, and it goes on. So, um, so posting short documentaries, I normally say to my students, is kind of the beginning. It's, it's the, the first step, it's the start of what can happen when we're thinking about online documentary or interactive documentary, or the kinds of things that are made possible by working with digital platforms. Um, has anyone seen The Block? Kylie, you're not allowed to answer. Uh, has anyone seen this online documentary, The Block? Okay, a couple of people have. Okay, oh, a few people have, that's great. Okay, so um, uh, this one is an immersive exploratory environment. We can move from day to night. It's not actually like a full 3D, it's not like a 360 degree documentary, but it's kind of anticipating that. It was made about it was three 360. Yeah. So it was every, like it was a photographer moving around and taking mm. photographs and then stitching it all together. And was it 2012? Am I it, around uh, then? Yeah, 2011 or 2012. It was sort of like, you think of it as a time capsule of the block before it was going to be demolished. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a fantastic work and has kind of lots of really good video content in there that you can access and cut your own path uh, work, moving through that work. And that's still accessible. Um, this one, I might show a little bit of this one. So this is um, experiencing the point of view of uh, someone in the middle of a devastating climate event. Or, um, or kind of reenacting it in after the storm. Is this one that we've got? I didn't preload that one. That's okay. I can probably click on it. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'll think about that day every day for the rest of my life. I'll, I will never forget that. You look at so many severe weather parameters. Usually there's a checklist of 30, 40, they were all in place. So we knew that the day would be very significant. We had 62 tornadoes that day, 62 that day. The last time we had an event like this, I was a senior in high school. This was April 1974. That was called the Super Outbreak. Prior to that, we had an event March 21st, 1932. And I don't know if we'll have another day like that in my watch. And next time we have a day like that, I'll probably be in the cemetery. I've invested my whole life here. I have a very personal connection with all this. This is very personal to me. And there's no rules written. There's no manual on how to do this. And so, you know, you, you just do the best you can without getting emotional or you know, all upset. Watching that thing come up into town, it was just, it was horrifying. So I'm just going to...
this. So, so there's around about you know 15 different um, areas that you can can navigate around. So my plan was to settle in on the couch to watch a man in suspenders talk for hours, showing maps of severe weather throughout the state. In the South, this preoccupation is as familiar as Saturday afternoons watching college football. When I finally turned on the TV, numerous tornadoes had already hit the state. Gunnersville and Arab that morning, and Coleman County that afternoon. To the north of us, a major tornado was ravaging the cities of Phil Campbell and Hackleburg. Then a storm developed southwest of us. I moved the vacuum cleaner out of the hallway closet. It just kept moving toward Tuscaloosa like it was on rails. Then the camera from downtown Tuscaloosa showed this, a massive tornado moving our way. Look at the debris, look at the debris in that. Zoom, zoom in tighter, Jason, if, if we can go in tighter. Look at that, goodness gracious. This okay, so I'm just gonna stop that for now. This one here is a lovely work. I really recommend that you spend some time having a look at it. Bear 71 is actually portrayed. It's a, a documentary that's portrayed from the point of view of a bear. So um, uh, it's kind of tracking movements of animals around um, Canada, Banff National Park, I think it is and thinking about the ways that humans are encroaching on the natural world. So this one initially was made as a flash project, flash-based project by the National Film Board of Canada, and they've got a 360-degree version, uh, which we might get, get a little look at later. Uh, so they kind of updated that, but it's a really fantastic work. It also draws upon the affordances of our own cameras in, um, in our machines, because it's asking you just, just in the same or in a similar way, not quite the same way, that the cameras are being actually surveilled and tracked. It's asking whether or not it can access the camera on your machine as you're navigating the work to see whether or not you can be a little bit surveilled and tracked as you're, as you're navigating that experience. Okay, and of course, um, you know, we're used to documentary telling the stories of people who don't normally have a voice. This is a really interesting work, one of the first um, online documentaries made in Australia by David Goldie and Sahail Dadal. Um, and Long Journeys, Young Lives tells the story of child refugees. This is a story that just doesn't go away. This project was, uh, was launched in 2002. It actually still runs, which is extraordinary. It was the first project that was built using Flash. And um, yeah, it's quite kind of extraordinary that it still runs. But what's interesting about it is that it is also, it's almost kind of um, imagining social media and it's portraying different points of view because as well as the refugee children, it also interviews a number of Australian school children of similar age as the refugees and gets them to start considering what would, you know, how do you think you'd react in a situation like this? What, how do you feel about refugees now? Or, you know, what if there was violence in your country? So, so it's kind of almost predicting, almost anticipating social media coming and allowing people to come in and actually give their own perspective. So it's a really quite interesting work. It looks really dated now, and the video is like absolutely tiny on the screen, but, um, but you know, really quite, a, quite a, an outstanding work, especially when it first came out. This is another work you can't actually access now. Again, refugees, it's a story that doesn't go away. This was an amazing project that was funded by the Australia Council to the, um, uh, well, Philip Rudd was, was very unhappy about it when he found out about it. So the, he was the um, foreign minister at the time. And it's a game modification of a game called Half-Life. And what happened was it was a Mel Melbourne-based uh, games developers collaborated with journalists who wanted to tell the story of Woomera Detention Centre. So what they did was um, the journalists went and spent a lot of time interviewing refugees at Woomera, and then they, they turned it into a game where, where the idea is you're trying to break out of Woomera. 
So it's called Escape from Woomera. You can't actually access it now. You can maybe find some videos online, but it was uh, really quite a groundbreaking, serious game. So one of the first serious games, which is something that Kylie's probably heard of quite a bit as well. SBS do some fantastic ones. Um, so serious games are kind of a, a genre within online documentary. So, so th this got a lot of attention and um, quite a lot of angst from, from certain parts of um, our, our government at the time. Okay, what else? Oh, this is, here we go, SBS, um, telling stories of people who don't normally have a voice, refugees again, and this one came out last year. Um, and we had Ella Rubley come in and speak to, to our class, our subject on this, or actually on just SBS, online.co in general. Um, so this one is an Instagram documentary. So you know, how do you speak to a younger generation? How do you speak to young people who maybe are not necessarily going to be automatically interested in documentary? How can we bring content to them in new ways? So SBS, I'm sorry, I'm saying stuff no, that I'm, you're probably... This is completely <laughs> surreal. I love it. It's amazing. Um, SBS, you know, are, have, are actually doing a lot of experimentation with online documentary form, um, as have the ABC, who have been, or, or yeah, ABC and the AFC used to actually have um, a documentary, an online documentary fund. Um, so this one is short videos that are accessible via Instagram. So, so you can still um, experience that. This is a delightful work. It's hard to look at now. You need to set up your machine so that you can still see flash. Welcome to Pine Point is a delightful, gorgeous, um, very retro, very kind of quirky, personal work about a town that doesn't really exist anymore, a town that disappeared, and it's going on uh, personal memory. But it's all done in this kind of beautifully analog um, aesthetic that is, you know, very kind of touchable and and gorgeous to navigate around. So, so that's a really interesting kind of highly multimedia experience. <clears throat> I'm not going to play anymore because I'm going to run out of time. So this is another one made by the National Film Board of Canada. Again, it's a flash work. It's a beautiful work made by a single person who was a designer. And it's about, um, it's about relationships and distance. So uh, the idea of um, what happens when, when we're separated from the people that we love. So in this, her brother is fighting a war in the Middle East and she's remembering him via the objects that, that are his. And then you're um, hearing a conversation with her and her brother. So a kind of phone, a, a quite staticky phone conversation. We're, getting, we're seeing that play out there. We're getting the text of that. But interestingly, after about three, you've seen about three or four objects, it asks you for your phone number and whether or not they can, SM, she can SMS you to talk about life. So that actually still operates. So, um, so that's kind of a fun one to take a look at as well. And thinking about distance and bringing people together. Okay, what else do we have? This was a very big budget work, Fort McMoney. Um, it's kind of like filmic documentary meets game aesthetic. Um, and kind of you get to vote as a kind of member of a community on the future of, um, of a, a town which is in the middle of kind of petroleum fields. And actually Fort McMurray went up, it had massive fires a couple of years ago, which was quite strange after we spend a lot of time looking at this work. This is a beautiful work, big budget work, made by David Dufresne, who was a documentary filmmaker. Um, and um, there's a lot of kind of fantastic uh, video content in there, but very interesting in terms of the game-like aesthetic. Okay, what else? <clears throat> Here's another work that Kylie will know. Um, and we're thinking about affordances. We're thinking about the affordances of digital and in this work, which is a, a language reclamation, a language preservation project, My Grandmother's Lingo, which is about learning an Indigenous language, preserving an Indigenous language. Um, they've done something very clever. They've worked with the, the specific affordances of the machines 
and they're working with the, the microphone. So you can actually speak into the microphone and it will register what you're, what you're saying as a way of learning that language. Okay. So, but what, Megan, what about the technical challenges? And there are lots of technical ta challenges with working online. So, um, one of the biggest is that your project can become obsolete fairly quickly, or maybe not fairly quickly, but over time. And that's due to changes in softwares, in platforms, in technology, in devices. So, so a number of works which were made with Flash, which was actually a really good software that allowed a high degree of animation, video, audio, etc. Apple decided it didn't like Flash anymore and it slowed down its machine. So Flash has kind of become, has been becoming obsolete. It's a little bit harder to look at these works now, but you know, HTML5 has come along and people are making work in, in these other platforms, but it is always something we need to watch out for, which can make things a little bit tricky. But um, technology can become obsolete but new opportunities also emerge. So it's actually a really exciting space to be working in and to be playing around in because new technologies emerge. So for example, locative documentary, so documentary that is tied to place, that is experienced in place, that perhaps is actually, you're using your mobile phone, it's reading your GPS and actually there's kind of content that is tied to GPS locations that you're accessing while you're in the location. Um, this is a work that I made and that was in the Sydney Festival in 2013. It's not a documentary work, it was a locative fiction at Middlehead National Park and um, it was locative and also AR, so the image on the right there is actually the image from from your iPhone and you could tap on those notes and see the video that was associated there. So that was, um, that was exhibited at Middlehead National Park and crafted for that location. Okay, so a, all, these, all these tech terms start coming out, locative media, AR, VR, you know, what, what is this stuff? So augmented reality means kind of like a layer on top of the world. So, we, and you might, you might have it via your Google Glasses or you can have it just via your mobile phone or your iPad. So this is a project, for example, the Chicago Zero Zero project, which works with um, archival contents and allows you to see Chicago, you know, in the 1930s or, or historical images, historical video, historical audio, while you're walking around the location. And they've actually made both an AR and VR versions of this, but this is kind of showing some of the AR kind of approach. You can see people outside a building there and you know accessing that content while in the location. <clears throat> and of course, you've probably heard of VR. Uh, if you're interested in film, you've probably um, been, been keeping across these changes that have been happening. It's really quite enormous. Um, re-emergence of VR since around about 2014 and the kind of huge amount of um, investment in cameras, in um, camera rigs, in software, in headsets, etc, etc. So, so these are some works and there are a whole lot more. Collisions is an amazing Australian work by Lynette Walworth. Emmy Award winning was at the Sundance um, Got the Sundance New Frontiers. Uh, New Frontiers residency was the first one to get New Frontiers, I think. Shot on shot on a drone um, in uh, the remote in the outback, and it's about the it's an amazing work. It's about the collision between the traditional Matu people and nuclear technology in the 1960s. It's actually really extraordinary work. Um, Autism TMI, you might not think of it as a documentary, it's this really interesting crossover between kind of medical meets documentary, but it's about this notion of empathy. So there's a lot of interest in, in 360 storytelling and um, VR documentary in terms of empathy. So this idea that can you actually step into someone's shoes? Can you see what they're seeing? Can you hear what they're hearing? Do you actually become immersed and therefore become more 
engaged in that experience, more understanding, more empathetic. So the one in the middle is actually about, um, it's kind of depicting, it's working with the National uh, Autism Council in Britain and it's giving um, a kind of depiction of what it's like for like a 10 year old child to go to a shopping centre with autism. So it's quite a short experience, it's only about two minutes and of course it becomes kind of more and more intense um, but nobody got hurt. Okay, and then the third one again, refugees, it's just a set story that doesn't go away. So um, it's a, Inside Manus is a dramatised VR experience that's illustrated, <coughs> animated and has um, given you further insights. What else do we know? What else can we see? <coughs> Sorry. So, we've also seen highly cinematic VR works like uh, this project here. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of experimentation happening around cinematic VR, 360 degree storytelling, 360 doco. This one, The Last Goodbye, uh, came out, I think, 2018 or it might have been 2017. It's a, a 360 VR doco um, that you can see people experience it in an exhibition format there, but it takes you inside the, the Majdanek concentration camp as told by a survivor, Pinchas Guta. <laughs> and I'm going to finish just by showing you um, this one here, which, which is um, a project that launched last week. It's an Instagram documentary, but it's a reenactment. It has about 70 separate um, posts very big budget, multi-million dollar budget, um, launched in Israel, running consecutively uh, for, for the Holocaust Memorial Day, which happened last Wednesday. So I'm going to just uh, finish on that. Hi, my name's Ima. Welcome to my page. Look at the number um, of views. This is my page for Random Thoughts. Crushes, my hashtag BFFs. One day, I'll be a famous reporter. But for now, I live with my grandparents. Now you make a crush. <laughs> Good, you Jew. Hitler conquered us. Like that. Oh, my God. Images. 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 So that's uh, got a lot of attention, an incredible amount of views and, um, you know, is, is another example of working with the affordances of digital in this instance, social platform, talking to a younger audience, the liveness, all the people commenting, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's it. So I'll come and sit down. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a, an incredible uh, and extremely thorough sort of overview of the landscape there. And that last one there is just incredible in terms of the numbers and the scale. You said multi-million pound budget? Is yeah, that... I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure, but from what I've read, it appears to be in the millions. It was funded by an Israeli millionaire or billionaire. Wow. Um, yeah, and the production values looked high. They were very so. high. Okay, well, look, what I might do, I might jump to a listener yeah. and then we'll come back as a panel um, at the end and have some any questions. So, again, if you've got any questions about any of those, just save them up. Um, Alyssa, I don't know, I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and also, I suppose, just give a brief overview of Screen Australia's role in this sure. space. Yeah. Um, well, as Rich said earlier, I'm Alyssa and I work at Screen Australia as an investment manager in the documentary unit and um, I was in the development role for many years and um, more recently um, uh, working across the production slate. Um, Screen Australia um, you know, is really committed to um, keeping um, up to date with viewing habits and um, trying to reach younger audiences as well. Um, just to keep ourselves relevant um, in many ways. Um, hence, we've done a number of um, online initiatives um, over the years. And um, also, we are funding online content 
um, through our um, production fund, through the producer program most specifically. Um, so what I really wanted to do is just to give you a kind of an overview of some of the stuff that we have funded. And um, then from that, if you've got like specific questions about um, what we will and won't um, kind of fund, I think that's the easiest way to do it. Um, so I just threw this list together. Um, hopefully you can read it. Um, and I, I may have missed a couple of projects on there, but um, firstly, I just wanted to talk about some of the initiatives that we've um, we've done um, recently. Um, we, we hopefully all know about the initiative with the Guardian. Um, we commissioned four projects out of that. Um, one of them's up on the website. So it's called Where the River Runs Red. It's a really great portrait of a um, town um, in uh, Queenstown, a town in Tasmania. And if you haven't seen it, you really should watch it. It's excellent short doc, it's 20 minutes. Um, we've got a second one coming up um, in the next few months called Lost Rambos. And um, definitely keep an eye out for that as well. Um, we also um, did an uh, initiative with Vice, which you might all know about, and I know Inde is going to talk about her project, Shooting Cats. That was the first one that came out of that sort of pitching competition, and we've just commissioned another one, um, which you, we should be completed by the end of the year. And we'll do that competition again, um, so if you have an idea that's suitable, you should definitely um, keep an eye out for when the, the deadlines are and so forth. Um, then the other one I wanted to talk about was DOCO 180, which is um, sort of a, came about in a different way than some of these other ones and with a, quite a different partner in News Limited. Um, they approached us uh, for this one and just didn't know how to reach um, documentary filmmakers. So we just did a very short in, uh, initiative for three minute projects um, for their new platform uh, called Women, uh, which is, stands for With Her In Mind Network. So it's sort of female focused. It's like um, a Mamma Mia, but sort of for News Limited. And we've been uh, each year commissioning about five projects um, out of that that have to be directed by women. Um, very short, it's uh, three minutes, really quite um, tricky, I think, for a lot of the filmmakers to kind of uh, get a, a story into such a short um, form. Then um, the other one, oh yes, Skip Ahead is another one that's been around now that's with Screen Australia for... Uh, a few years now, like seven years even, and um, just this year, last year, we opened it up th uh, to documentaries as well, um, which was really quite exciting. Um, it's with uh, Google, uh, YouTube, uh, behind that. Um, out of about 30 applications, about half of them ended up being documentary, and um, we've moved ahead with one um, in the current crop, and um, it's very likely we'll do that again next year. So again, you have to have an existing YouTube channel for that, but you should definitely, if you do have one, um, you should do, definitely keep an eye on what the requirements are. They're fairly low, the eligibility. It's 25,000 subscribers, I think, for your channel, or at least one video that's had maybe over a million views. Um, but that's a really great opportunity as well because um, Google, YouTube really get behind them and um, make sure they sort of promote them as much as possible. Um, now, in addition to all of that, which I think a lot of people don't really know, is how much um, online content we have funded through the producer program. Um, so I've got a list um, behind me, and hopefully you know a lot of these titles. A lot of them are completed and out there. Um, what I wanted to show you was a couple of clips of things that haven't been, um, are not out in the world right now, but uh, um, either being made or will be released soon. Um, now, the, the, the thing to keep in mind is applying through the producer program, you are competing against all other formats. You're competing against um, feature docs. Um, you're competing against VR. You're competing against, um, uh, you know, one-offs. So a lot of people wonder, well, how am I ever going to be competitive, um, you know, competing against all these other formats? So really what, what can make a project, an online doc, stand out in any of these rounds is it's... Um, it still needs to have that innovation with a strong um, creative vision and be culturally relevant. But the key thing is really finding that new um, pathway to an audience and being able to demonstrate that you've kind of got an audience base out there and reaching, as I said before, a younger demographic. Um, so the three clips that I wanted to show kind of speak to that quite well. Um, the first one is A Game of Three Halves. It's, um, we just funded it very recently. Um, it's a short form um, series, an animated history of soccer. And, and you might wonder why we would fund something like that, but um, 
it's Closer Productions, Matt, Matt Bates down in South Australia, and he developed this relationship with a soccer website called Copa 90. Does anyone know it? Just one person, we've got one soccer fan here. But anyway, they have huge reach. They've got incredible reach, which um, they were able to prove, including in Australia um, and in China as well, which was really interesting to us. And um, so Matt um, Bates applied with, you know, for a small amount of money to make this series and um, was able to demonstrate that he had this incredible pathway. And um, he produced a really great clip, um, which I'm going to show you, that sort of um, solidified the idea and um, it was, in, in that regard, it was very competitive when it came through. Um, then the second clip should we, is... Should we play the clip first and then... If you want, if you want to do it, I was just going to introduce all of them okay. and then cool. just uh, show them all in uh, one go. The second clip is um, something, uh, a short, another short animated. We don't just fund animated, it's just random that I pick these three <laughs> clips, that, uh, two clips that happen to be animated, but... Um, I, uh, they, this one is called Bright Lights and it's a, um, a, a short documentary about Pokey's addiction. Um, mm -hmm. it, it had a really great social media first release strategy when it came in. Um, it's short, it's only 12 minutes, but since it's been <coughs> completed, um, they've actually been picked up by The Guardian, which um, you know is good in many ways, but... Um, uh, and I'm really delighted, but it's sort of different from... The, we didn't fund it with The Guardian attached early on because they did have this really great social media. So they'll do cut-down clips as well um, to promote the longer version on The Guardian. Um, and they also um, just got uh, Claudia Carvin to do the, um, uh, the voice narration, so you, you might recognise her voice. Um, and then the third clip, I just wanted to do a little sneak peek of the new series of Jocko 180. Um, I'm just showing you a 30 second clip um, that will go out um, at the end of May um, via women.com.au and they also push them out uh, on their Facebook sites. The last batch were getting really great numbers. Some of them are up to 600, 700 views now. Um, so we have high hopes for this new season and women will often do some editorial to promote um, you know, the topics in each of the each of the projects and this one is um, called A Hairy Problem. You can probably guess um, what it's about, female body hair. Um, so I think it's going to really, uh, you know, generate a lot of conversation around the topic. Um, so, please, if Alan, if you could roll the clips, that'd be great. It was just a stupid thing that people did at the pub. But I just watched this happen more and more over time and I thought, this is actually pretty boring. Instead of us just sitting around the table talking like we used to, they just sat around these machines. That's all they wanted to do. And we didn't talk anymore. And so I just sort of stopped going. Because I had really hairy legs, I used to get called pig legs. Someone's got hairy armpits, oh, you're disgusting. I feel like I need to go, oh, sorry, I haven't shaved my legs. Oh, sorry. You're a hippie or you smell. I was shamed into shaving my leg hair by my first boyfriend. But I have to deal with the looks and the comments. Your arms are so hairy, you look like an ape. I was wearing a singlet and someone told me to shave my armpits. Children ask me, are you a man or a woman? 
white friends made me hyper aware of myself as a black woman with lots of body hair. I was asked in grade seven in front of my whole class if my pubic hair um, was red too, which at the time I was mortified. To the degree now still if I hear someone, you know, say fan of pants, I want to throat punch them. <laughs> You have to keep an eye out for all of those things that will be launched in the next few months. Um, the only thing, else, the other thing that I kind of wanted to mention um, is just some of the platforms that we're sort of tracking and keeping a close eye on. Um, it, it's an ever-changing space, as you all know. Um, people suddenly have money, then they don't have money. It's really hard to keep track of who's actually commissioning things. Um, but as you probably all know, Facebook Watch launched here. Um, we'll, you know, really uh, watching what they were doing here um, closely, hoping that they'd start commissioning uh, um, local content. That has not happened, um, disappointingly, but um, we, we, you know, have an ongoing dialogue with them anyway. And um, same with um, Instagram TV. Um, the other thing that I just saw recently, Snapchat um, Originals, um, they started commissioning uh, con uh, documentary content uh, in the US. Um, they've partnered with BuzzFeed on that, and um, that is meant to be um, be available globally um, by the end of this month. So it's definitely a space to watch. Um, where I think there might be future opportunities, um, uh, YouTube Originals um, of moving from um, a subscription service to ad supported, and uh, they're actively looking for commissioning partners. Again, whether they're going to work with Australia um, is really um, to be seen. It's still early days. Um, same with Viacom. Um, they said they're committed to short form. Um, they, they own like MTV, Comedy Central, um, Spike. Um, I, I mentioned Skip Ahead earlier, but I reiterate, like uh, we'd love to see more documentary uh, proposals coming through. Um, uh, if you, you do have an uh, existing YouTube channel or you know someone that has an existing YouTube channel that's trying to move into documentary um, content, that's definitely an opportunity. Um, then there's another platform which uh, I'm kind of really curious about called Quibi. Has anyone heard of Quibi? Um, it's uh, short for Quick Bites. It's an awkward name, but um, that is, has a lot of cash behind it. Um, in um, Jeffrey Katzenberg, ex-Disney um, executive, has set this up. It's a video streaming service. They're um, launching, I think, later this year, and they're aiming to have um, 5,000 um, 10-minute original uh, programming shorts on their streaming. It's for mobile phones and... Um, and uh, Did you say 5,000? 5,000, yeah. They've got a lot of cash behind them. Um, so whether, and they're getting a lot of like high profile um, talent as well. Again, whether they're going to work in Australia, I don't know, but it's just definitely something um, that could be an opportunity um, for Australian document. And docs are definitely in the mix for that too. Um, uh, they keep referencing that in any anything that they're, um, you know, any, any publicity they put, they do mention documentaries. So, um, that's really all I wanted to say. I think uh, if all of you are, n are not um, signed up to our e-news, um, you should be, and also follow us on um, social media. That's where we're announcing a lot of our, we will announce all of our funding uh, rounds, all of the produce program, all of that stuff that was um, up there on the board, we've announced um, in various uh, releases. Um, we promote, when, when on online docs are up, we'll promote them actively on social media. And then, um, all of our call outs for any initiatives that we do, um, we actively promote them. Um, so that's a really way, great way to keep engaged um, with us, just to see you know, what, what we're doing and what we're funding. So I'm going to throw a quick question to you there, which is, because obviously with things like Docker 180, it's quite clear what the objective is. But in the holistic sense of the whole screen Australia being in this space, yeah. what's... What's the key objective? Is there, is there one or is there...? Well, it's, as I said before, it's definitely um, new pathways to audiences and um, appealing to a younger demographic, definitely. It's, it's still anything that comes through the producer door still has to speak to innovation and cultural relevance and all of those other um, criteria, strong creative visions, all of that other criteria that um, applies to the producer program. So it has to be that and it still... It has to... Uh, you know, we, ha has to, we have to be able to justify why we, we're putting money into something. If it's, we're putting money into something and it's going to not be seen by anyone, then that is definitely not going to be competitive or a handful of people. 
So can I ask them why Screen Australia don't have a dedicated stream? Or is it more to be more inclusive or is it more to... Um, well, really, you know, our budgets were cut um, pretty significantly and we lost a um, pot of money uh, a few years ago now and uh, there, there was a, a separate fund. Mm. Um, so we have condensed it, but in saying that... Um, we are having a review of our um, programming uh, guidelines and um, another reason to sign up for social media is because we're, we'll announce that um, hopefully uh, at the end of you know, June or July when that will all take place, so a discussion paper. And, and maybe that's something that, um, you know, I, I encourage everyone to engage with that. We want to hear from all sorts of people about um, whether, but we've basically got two pots of production money and whether that's really working. Um, and I think that conversation around online should definitely be part of that. Mm. It's an important part of it. And, and just kind of in terms of budgets, because, I mean, the rivers run red, the production values of that are outstanding. Yeah, they and that was a very low budget doc. There you go. Yeah. So, I mean, is there a general kind of ballpark? Or well, not really. I mean, honestly, they've been so varied. I really um, hesitate to say that there's a ballpark. In our guidelines, we've got something like 2,000 a minute, but quite frankly, we've seen things less than that. And we've certainly seen things more than that. I haven't seen a multi-million dollar Instagram um, TV <laughs> doc yet, and I doubt we would fund that, but you know, it's, um, right. it's exciting to see things at um, yeah. the, the higher end as well. Okay. Thank you very much for now. No worries. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move along to Kylie. Kylie, if you want to just, uh, I suppose, just again, just I suppose give a brief overview of SBS's role and in this space, but then also your own work in this space as well as, a, as an interactive filmmaker. Sure. Hi everybody. Um, so SBS is um, your multicultural and multilingual broadcaster and so the difference for us is that we want to tell stories that are unheard. We want to tell, we want to work with communities, multicultural communities and Indigenous communities and we have connections to those communities and we're working to tell stories that is relevant to all Australians including communities that are underrepresented. So everything that we do um, is judged by our charter. Um, and that is the first that is the first thing that we look at when we're making projects, whether it's internally, like the kind of projects that my team makes, or whether we're commissioning. Um, of course, it's important to mention that when we're talking about the space, SBS is a big organisation, and so that space, that online space, and the multi-platform space extends to news and extends to ALC Radio, which is 68 language groups, and it extends to the team that I work in, which is TV and online content. Um, so I'm a commissioning editor within the commission content team, So, um, and I'm exclusively online. Uh, traditionally, though, we've worked all well, in the last six years when I've been at SBS, I've worked as an internal production unit. So a lot of the projects, and it was so wonderful to hear you speak. So thank you so much. Um, so lovely to hear um, sort of a really rigorous conversation around these projects because every single project is an experimentation in form. And so when you are talking about interactive docs in the sense of web docs, because I think the term interactivity is changing all the time. And the fact we just saw um, Netflix going into interactivity, we see BBC mm -hmm. going into interactivity, mm -hmm. that's a really, really interesting mm -hmm. realm. I'm fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting too, in the Netflix example in Bandersnatch, it was a choose your own adventure, which is not what interactivity is, mm -hmm. it's one form of. And so we're definitely at this um, stage where we're trying to explore and what may have been considered a niche kind of form of documentary filmmaking, which is the kind of stuff that I do and the stuff that Megan's been talking about, is definitely wide open into the world. And when we did our, our um, Instagram documentary, She Called Me Red, last year, that was so obvious, you know, just the sense that you're working on this democratic platform that everybody has, or it's something like 9 million Australians has. It's not even the most used social media platform, but just the way in which you could, almost like we thought of that project as a Trojan horse, you know, going into people's feeds, uh, presenting stories that were relevant to Australia, relevant to us as SBS, telling an untold story in that case of the Rohingya community, a community that feels that they're the most um, unwanted community in the world when we're doing research for that project. And then to be able to tell one person's story, um, Eunice, who lives in Melbourne, and his family in the Rohingya refugee camp and tell that story over a period of three weeks to the point that the audience that we were engaging with knew him, knew his family, cared, had, had faces and names and it went beyond the headlines and it went beyond traditional journalism, integrating both documentary storytelling, news journalism um, 
and in our case, two animation and illustration, which I'm a huge fan of. Mm. Um, and certainly when, when I did the boat, I realised how much people love illustration animation online. Um, and so we've, we've been through a series of um, animated <laughs> interactive documentaries. So we did The Boat, um, My Grandmother's Lingo, we did Gari, which was a story about the island, commonly known as Fraser Island, but we told, again, a dual perspective story working with Fiona Foley, who's a butchula woman from Gari, um, telling her version of um, the story mm. and then telling Eliza Fraser, who was this woman mm. who lived on the island for six weeks and then left and sort of serialised a story in the newspapers in Great Britain. Um, and we had, um, and I've completely forgotten the name of the person who voiced it and she's very famous. It'll come back to me. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so we were able to tell that story through the two perspectives and we were able to frame that story as fake news, which was really interesting too for us um, to be able to tell stories in a really, really contemporary way, uh, relevant. And often our work does kind of fit within that journalism strand and we sit um, in sort of that innovation category in the Walkleys with a lot of um, success in that area uh, because we do straddle both of those forms, often documentary and journalism, as do so many documentaries. That's just been the case in the kind of work that we've done in um, my team. Um, so SBS and online, obviously we work across the online platforms. We have multiple verticals that create content. We have the on-demand platform. Um, we've recently had an initiative uh, with state funding bodies for short form um, that was on demand. We've commissioned content for on demand, be it um, Homecoming Queens, which of course is a drama, but, but we did that, and Robbie Hood, which is coming out shortly with Ludo Productions. It's definitely something that we're engaged with. Um, as I said, traditionally my, my area has been in the interactive doc space, uh, but one thing I do know is that it's always changing mm. and it's always, um, it's always something that you have to be kind of thinking laterally about. You have to think about what platforms are existing, how can you find your audience, what does documenting mean, all the good questions, you know, because we don't have, we don't have um, even like a genre in a fixed sense. You know, those, the genres and for us and the storytelling is always evolving and changing and experimenting you know we work to see what does work we want to see we look very hard at data we look at analytics we see how long people engage in projects when do they jump off sometimes it's depressingly short amounts of time um, but with our projects they're evergreen projects so with the boat it's going to hit a million users um, but it's growing week on week on week and that project has it's again it's about refugees mm. where obviously that's a topic that we're so dedicated to and so it's so important for us at SBS to tell those stories from multiple communities um, but it's always about finding the way to tell the story that's going to resonate and that's the challenge mm. um, something like the boat which was an adaptation of a short story by Nam Lee who's a Melbourne Vietnamese ra beautiful story he did an anthology I think it was in 1999, but I'm not sure. Uh, but it did really, really well. And that story had not been adapted and it, we, the rights were available, so we licensed it and we, we adapted it as an interactive graphic novel and we broke the form of graphic novels. We changed it for online. No one had done that type of form before. That's something else that's really interesting in this space that mm. you can do, you can create something new. It's about def redefining genre, redefining storytelling. Um, and that project, we launched at a time with the 40 year, 40 year anniversary of the fall of Saigon and um, the Vietnamese boat people that arrived in 1975 into Australia. And that project then was a, it was a story with a historical lens. It was a historical story. It was a fiction, but it was an every person story because what we realised was within that community, that story was relevant to the entire Vietnamese diaspora. Matt Quinn, who was the um, illustrator, felt like it was his story because his parents had gone through refugee camps, the same refugee camps that Nam Lee had gone through. Um, and it resonated directly with that community. It resonated with wider Australia and it's still going. So um, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a great example of how a project can have a real voice, a global voice. I mean, that's something we, or of course, you need to talk about that online unless it's geo-blocked. It's available to the world. So you're speaking to, in our case at SBS, we're speaking to Australians. Like, that's our primary audience. But those stories then have a, a lens onto the world and access, uh, is ac mm. are accessed by the world. And the inverse is back on to Australia in terms of how the world sees Australia as well. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. And we work really closely and we love the work of NFB and Arte as well as another organisation mm. in France mm. who's dedicated to this kind of work. But mm. I think that as 
technology is exploding, there is that whole democratisation of, of social media platforms and accessibility, people are borrowing from each other's forms. So what might have existed in the realm of, you know, the networks and the broadcasters, we're exploring this form. Then it's sort of, you know, we borrow from ads and we borrow from journalism and it's all that, it's that dialogue between all these different forms and different um, outlets, which is also really interesting. So Missing is the one that we've just released and that's mm. all of these um, interactives it's sbs.com.au and that one's forward slash missing um, and that's just such an incredible story. I felt like I was stealing that story from a feature film. Like it was just, um, it's an amazing story of an eight year old girl who was abducted near her family home in 1966 and she, Wendy, who did survive, wanted to tell the story to honour Jimmy James, who is um, one of the two Pitinjara trackers who found her. Mm. Um, and that story had never been told from Wendy's point of view. Mm. And then we were able to sort of honour Jimmy, Jimmy's legacy in particular and Daniel's legacy. So that was a really, really special project. And I guess to sort of, you know, we make these internally largely because of the technological capabilities as well. As Megan mentioned, uh, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of tech that goes into these projects. As you're creating the concepts for these projects, you have to think about tech at the same time. They're not exclusive. Projects that fail are when they're a linear documentary and you try to throw in some technology. It doesn't, doesn't work. So it's very much a kind of joined up approach. Um, but every single project that we do, we're able to bring in um, creatives. And that's really amazing. So with Missing, we're able to work with Tamara Dean, who's an incredible photographer. Um, and I've worked with Sam Petty a couple of times. He's an incredible sound designer. Um, and so, yeah, we're able to work with a lot of creators and we piece together teams in that way. That's only one model of, of how it works. Um, and NITV have just commissioned a VR piece called Future Dreaming that was just a Tribeca. Screen Australia funded it. Screen Australia funded it. Um, <laughs> causing big waves in Tribeca. It looks, I've been following them, they look like they've been having a ball. So, um, yeah, so there are, I guess, um, in terms of the different things that SBS is doing, it is about looking for initiatives and call outs and announcements and following social media and making sure you're aware of what's going on. I mean, we need to be able to communicate to you what, what we're doing. Um, uh, and similarly, just making sure that you're just keep keep an eye out on what's happening across those various platforms and channels at SBS, including NITV, um, SBS, and and SBS News. But I mean, any questions? If you've got any questions about specific projects, or because each project is its own model of production, I'm super happy to answer any of them. One just to fire off straight away. Um, in terms of demographics, you mentioned data and in terms of being able to see how audience interact with these and especially when, when they're actually the interactivity how do you map that and sort of is there anything that's kind of being revealed through that data um 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, it, how quickly people will jump off projects and how people, people, how to capture people's imaginations and keep them focused is a huge thing, especially when we're looking at multiple screens at any one time and people are not necessarily sitting at their desks looking at a project. Or, so those kind of things are challenging for us. How do you keep people? Do people return? We also look at returning viewers, so there's a lot of those as well in terms of engagement. Um, but yeah, we're always interested to see how quickly people stay on and, and how long they stay on for. And we always try to integrate that data and that knowledge back into projects. So what projects work well, whether it's something straight at the top like the boat, you're essentially in the scene, you're essentially in the project immediately with the boat. Um, and that's got a, a, a long tail in terms of people engaging mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. uh, with Missing, we try to put a scene straight away as well. So that kind of experimentation, how to get people in. How much interactivity is too much interactivity yeah. as well. So I'm not a fan of interactivity for interactivity's mm. sake. I think mm. that it really has to connect to the storytelling, mm. uh, why you're telling a story. So that last sort of sneak peek, we're doing interactive in Auslan, in Australian Sign Language, mm. using your onboard camera. And that is, again, you know, it's a similar kind of thinking in terms of my grandmother's lingo. Um, just in terms of the tech, you know, yeah. different tech, but the same kind of thing. But again, it's integral to the act of sign language to be able to do that. And so yeah. that is your point of interactivity. But whereas with My Grandmother's Lingo as a linear narrative, with this particular one, we want people to be able to jump between two points of view yeah. of a story. So it's our first love story. Mm. Um, yeah, so again, so it's building on the knowledge that the projects that we've done, but also looking at what other people are doing and seeing what works. We're very aware of what's going on. Really interested to see what other people are doing. And in terms of the international landscape, how much of the audiences are in Australia and how much outside? Do you know that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I, I don't really know of my most recent project. I remember we did a project called After 6-4, which was um, the 20th anniversary of the events in Tiananmen Square, and we specifically had a map at the end and we looked to see, and there were people from all over the world. Um, predominantly Australia is our project. Mm. That's where they, that's where the audiences are, but they there there's always people from all over the place and you don't kind of know. And you don't know when you're looking at that snapshot of that data because again because they're evergreen unless something breaks. And things mm. break like Chrome will change, like mm. a browser will change mm. and you'll have to update mm. the entire project. But it's not as bad as it sounds, but you know, that can happen and so all of a sudden we'll get a call from a school saying such and such a project doesn't work. I mean, that's a really important, I'm really happy with when our projects do go into schools and mm. they can be on the curriculum and, um, you know, as long as our schools have internet fast enough to run projects, which is another conversation, um, I really like that because we don't necessarily make projects specifically to educate, like we're making them for entertainment and education, like the whole package, mm. we're storytellers. But when they do find that audience, it's really gratifying. Um, you know, go back as well as similar, go back to where you came from yeah. is on curriculum. Um, the boat, so uh, those, uh, Cronulla, and the, you know, Cronulla won a Walkley, and so um, that's going to be in this sort of national archive of projects, along with Grandmother's Lingo and the, and the block. So those kind of things are really nice too, that there's that sort of recognition that these projects, they're not just pretty pictures on a screen, they're actually, they're storytelling, and they're innovating, and they're reaching audiences that don't always be reached. So. There are all those things going and on. And in terms of demographic, is it markedly younger? Or? It's hard for us to know. I mean, we could assume. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we did a project um, called Finding Margaret, which was with the photo media artist Anne Zahalka and Charlotte Wood. And, you know, I was experimenting with that. That's essentially a long read, and I wanted to know which audience would that go for, and I wanted to work on iPads because mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. demographic might be using mm -hmm. iPads. Um, but I don't know. I think... I. I, I, I you know, a huge uh, demographic on Facebook is over 50, you know, so I don't know. It's like, uh, we can't assume, mm. essentially. But again, I think it's about if it's interactivity for interactivity's sake, are people going to be bothered? Um, but if people, if you don't make it the barrier to entry too high, and that's not, a, that's not a comment on editorial, but that's sort of how do you engage people? How do you mm. invite people into a project? That's part of the work. So it's using the technology to embrace the storytelling. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 they work hand in hand. And did I hear earlier on you were saying that you commission uh, content? Do you actually accept submissions from externals or not? For, for these interactives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, <coughs> we are we people can always be in contact with me and give and tell me what their ideas are. That's not a that's not a question. We um we it it sort of tended to be more that. 
often they come from us and we bring people in, but there are other models. So uh, with Cronulla Riot, that was a long form commissioned by Screen Australia um, from Mary Ellen. Um, and uh, that was, that, that was uh, by Northern Pictures and they created that project. And then we worked on the interactive component of it. Um, after 6.4 was a freehand production and that was um, funded by a state agency and then we came in with the in-kind technology. So that's also a really good model for production where SBS might have the capabilities and the abilities in the tech space and expertise in that sort of storytelling and then we can partner with external creative. So there are, there are all different types of models. Mm. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I'm going to move on to Indy Ford. So Indai uh, was the inaugural winner of the uh, Pitch Australiana at AIDC in 2018 and since went on to make Shooting Cats which it set out to explore the consequences of the feral cat plague um, and confront uncomfortable and violent realities of dealing with it. Uh, since launching on Vice in late 2018 it's now had over 1 million views um, and, uh, and also the engagement of that has been huge in terms of comments and I think even in terms of... Uh, articles written on the subject, both in Australia, but also especially in the US. So, uh, welcome. Uh, I don't know, I think I'm just going to kick off with saying maybe uh, where you came with the idea and why you thought it would work for the picture Australiana. Yeah, sure, look, um, I guess everything uh, about this documentary came online. Um, I am from Outback Australia, so I have a big love for the natural environment and the Australian environment and also the um, the diverse Australian personalities out there. Um, I've always wanted to create a, an environmental impact film, um, but I was worried that a lot of the environmental films out there speak to the already converted eco-conscious audience. And I wanted to do something that was going to extend out of that audience and actually speak to a younger audience um, who you know, probably wouldn't watch something um, that was uh, about academics, you know, telling you what's right and what's wrong. Um, so I went out to my social media um, community and I put out the question, you know, what, what's a really good environmental topic that's um, controversial and that people actually like want to talk about? And um, I had a response from a friend who talked about um, his own experiences um, gaining a lot of backlash from um, people who don't understand why he goes out and shoots feral cats um, and how he doesn't do it because he hates the feral cats but because they are a real problem not just for the um, our native environment but for farmers as well uh, and that really interested me because I found that confronting but I also understood where he was coming from um, particularly being from the country myself and um, I remember um, being out on a um, rehabilitation project for um, some possums and that failing because um, the possums were actually being decimated by the feral um, animals. Uh, so yeah, that, that really interested me and I decided to do a documentary on, um, on people who shot feral cats. Uh, unfortunately, he was over in Western Australia and I was over here in um, Sydney. So. Um, I took out to social media again and just did a little bit of researching and exploring um, and just by talking to people and finding different forums and communities um, you come across, um, you, you learn a bit more about the subject um, but you also come across a lot of different people and so um, one of the subjects, Barry, he was well spoken about by a lot of the online community but he wasn't accessible online, he um, doesn't really carry around a mobile phone um, <laughs> He's got a landline and he's not online at all. Um, so he was difficult to get hold of. But um, when I did and I spoke to him about the issue, um, I just found, found him extremely interesting and um, unique. Um, so decided um, to put together a short film. Um, this one was about two other guys in Sydney. And from that, um, a producer approached me and together um, we came across um, a call out for Pitch at Viceland Pitch Australiana that was through um, uh, online newsletter as well from Screen Australia, <laughs> all online. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we put in our submission and uh, pitched at the 
AIDC in 2018 and were successful. So um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone here has actually seen the documentary, the full length doc documentary. It has aired online and on SBS now. Um, but we do have a short three minute clip if, if we can show that just yeah, for a second. Just before, before we do, that, that's been cut down and re edited. Yes. So that's been seen by how many views now? Oh, that one itself has been seen by over 2 million people. Um, mm -hmm. The online full documentary by 1 million people. But once again, that goes to show that you know people, um, especially online platforms, um, tend to be quite time poor. They want to be able to access content um, when they're commuting, um, you know, that whenever they want to, and um, from small devices as well. So short form depth tends to be um, popular. Here's a few bits and pieces that I make. Here's one, long and skinny. Then we have splat. This one's the heaviest, 7.2 kilo. And this is a special one. Strange, isn't it? Then I have my visitor's book. I'm on my second one now. I trap feral cats and not just removing the feral cats, but the skinning and the tanning and giving them another life. The cats that I've removed would probably have killed millions of birds. The bird life around the river has dramatically improved. I keep a record of every cat that I catch and the total's 1,438. 2.2. Well, the people who visit me and see my things, they put, think I'm doing a good job. Hello. Hello, Barry. Hello, my Ian. Ian. That's my friend Lola. Hello. Hi, I'm Lola. I'm the cat man. But there's people out there who probably don't think I'm doing a good job. Come in. <gasps> people think I'm a cat hater, but I'm not. We just hate the feral ones. Right, okay. You know, domestic cat just sits and meows and mm -hmm. says, meow, feed me. But it's the feral ones and the people who put them there that yeah, cause the yeah, issues. Yeah. And curiosity. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Curiosity. You know what curiosity did? <laughs> That's my art. These are my favourites. These are not for sale. Back off. <laughs> These are my favourites. Oh, right. They get How beautiful. They get names. This one's the softest. So Barry in Florida, I live on the edge of a swamp. I have my two cats inside and we have feral cats. And in St. Petersburg, Florida, there is a, a push to capture, neuter, and then release feral cats. I'm not interested in their breeding habits, it's their eating habits. Mm -hmm. And they're still gonna eat if they're out there. I don't wanna shoot them, but they're just not rehomeable. I'll be quite happy to give you a full feral, adult feral cat to take home and look after. Let me know how you get on. The farmer's rung me up and said he's seen cats here. Get one by the door here. And it's a bit cold and windy, they'll be looking for cover, so I'll set three here and see how I go. viewers there they would have noticed that that was actually cut, cropped in a different way yeah so that was done one by one uh, which is perfect for um, social media channels um, and it just optimizes it on um, channels like Facebook and Instagram um, and that's where we were getting a lot of engagement um, I guess the beauty of having something short like that to represent the longer form um, and having it on social media is everything on social media is measurable and um, which is a beauty. You can um, measure your demographic, you can measure the engagement, um, the sentiment as well. Um, and from that, I mean, that, a lot of the sentiment's public as well. So, and, and from 
the comments that we were getting, um, I could definitely see that it was achieving what I wanted and that was to get people talking about this controversial topic um, and wanting to explore more. Um, so we did find that there were mixed sentiment, um, but more so swaying towards um, an understanding for why it's done. Um, one thing, which is a shame about the shorter form, uh, the cut, what would you call it? The the cut down of the short form, uh, is unfortunately um, you can't delve into it anymore and um, a few things that um, the full length um, documentary does go into is, you know, um, why he does it, why he calls himself a hands-on environmentalist um, and also some of the other methods that are not as humane as shooting. So um, while it's confronting, it's an environmental topic that does need to be addressed. Um, so it was great to see that interaction on, on social media as well as seeing um, the viewings on the full length documentary which um, launched on YouTube um, at the same time as launching on Viceland, um, their Viceland online channel. In terms of how you approached the film, given you knew, you knew it was going to launch on YouTube and Vice and so then be seen by global audience, did that change how you approached the film and the storytelling? Absolutely. Um, I think, like you were saying, um, you know, we've, uh, the way people view content these days has really evolved, particularly online. Um, and with so much content out there and people being so short on time um, and with something like, I guess particularly with the um, Vice channel and the Vice audience, you really want to kind of hook them in in that first 30 seconds, probably even shorter than that, um, and make sure that you keep them intrigued. Um, so because of that, um, I've actually, I, I made sure that we did a good pre-title which was definitely confronting but wanted people to to actually learn more and watch um, the rest of the film. So the pre-title went for about one minute um, and showed some guys coming across a cage, um, shooting a cat, does black out, um, but then taking it back um, to um, a dusty old um, outback shack and um, saying they wanted to cut it open. And um, yeah, I think that did the job. <laughs> um, Apart from that, um, you know, once again, you're skewing younger online as well, so you want to appeal to a younger audience. Um, other things, um, you're speaking to a global audience as well, unless you're geo-blocking, um, as Kylie said. Um, so you want to make sure that you are setting the scene, setting the location, um, and giving some background to the situation. Um, and also you want to make sure that um, the communication is understandable as well. So. I was lucky with these guys. I don't think they really needed uh, any subtitles. Um, a lot of the audience um, for the online channels were um, from the US, surprisingly. Um, but I guess that's because that's where a lot of the nice audience is. Um, and yeah, they had no trouble with understanding the uh, accents. And <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, throw out to the audience, has anyone got any questions? Um, Rod, did you want them to go to the microphone or can they just shout yeah, it out? Yeah. So if anyone wants to, has anyone got any questions? Just a quick question about duration. You're all talking about short form, long form. How long is short form? Is great question. <laughs> and how long is long form? Alyssa, <laughs> in terms of the funding round, how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're really open to, uh, it really depends on the platform and what the, you know, it has to make sense to the story, essentially. So, I mean, as I said, I mean, we were doing three minute docs for Doco 180, um, but some of those um, other, uh, like a game of three halves, that's, um, uh, I think, six by ten minutes or something like that. And then for Art Bites, they were all six by five minutes, and it just has to make sense for what the story is you're trying to tell. Um, we sort of um, thought that 20 minutes was a good amount of time for interactive, but we're getting shorter and shorter. So, um, you know, between like 10 minutes, I think missing is, uh, missing is 10 minutes, but also knowing that you can, you don't actually know how long someone's going to spend on a project because they might move around the project and explore. They might reverse, so missing has technology that can actually reverse through the whole project. Um, so it's it's non-linear in that sense, and so people will go back over things they want to see. So you have a base, you have a ballpark of between say say ten to twenty minutes for these interactives, 
Um, and that's definitely a shift because when we did Cronulla, we had a, a 60 minute spine of a project and it was something like 220 pieces of content that we commissioned um, that allowed you to dive deeper into certain themes. So we looked at the themes, so that was a huge project. Mm -hmm. So we sort of we've, we've, ex we've sort of moved away from that into this sort of like now very much standalone, shorter form stories. That's the what I've been doing for the last few years. And is that responding to data and analysis, or responding to? Yeah, I mean, again, it's about what what makes sense. So in Cronulla, we had this sixty minute film, and so that's and it was this it's this epic film from the perspective of the Lebanese Australian and Muslim Australian communities of the Cronulla rides. It hadn't been told before. There were so many themes that needed to be explored. Um, so we went there. It was like this definitive text of of that, that period of time, and um, talked a lot of academics and 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 eyewitnesses and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's we all put it in there as a document. Um, and that was the purpose of that project. But, um, you know, for Missing, even though there was so much research in terms of all, we talked to all the searchers who were still alive, and <coughs> trawled through the archive, there's so much research, um, it, we distilled it down to two first person points of view for a total of 10 minutes. Mm. Mm. Megan, in terms of the interactive docs, is there kind of a space or a time frame that kind of is, is Oh, I think I think Kylie's right. I mean, shorter is is the thing because I think ten minutes is actually a long time in a way. And when I'm advising students, I, I tell them that their clips of if they're using video it really needs to be no longer than two minutes because our attention spans are just so much shorter now. But um, but obviously it depends on the content as well. But absolutely, like I think you can assume five to, uh, like 10 minutes of engagement is quite a long time. I mean, you, you mentioned the attention spans are shorter, it's also the competition for our attention. That's it's right. It's just endemic and it's huge now. And that's, that's also right. part of it. So it's not just about the attention spans being shorter, but also about the fact that, well, if they, after two minutes they're not engaged, they're going to go somewhere else. That's right. Or there's even a, there's an old rule that's called the three clicks rule, if you can't find what you want within three clicks, you're gone. And it's kind of the same if you're thinking about online content, if you if you can't find something. With Stocker 180, <laughs> we, we talked about the first 30 seconds, and mm. News Limited were very adamant that first 30 seconds, if it doesn't grab them, then forget it. Yeah, yeah. It's tough out there. Mm. It, it is. <laughs> It'd be, if you think about you know what you look at on your own social media feed, I'm probably I'm within 30 seconds, I'm probably three seconds even. <laughs> or, like, you know, go on to the next thing. So I, I do understand that. You just have to think about it and yeah. set up a lot. Um, you have to put a lot more thought into that. How you going to grab people in? And, and so that's where um, shooting cats worked so well because it was so controversial. It's a great hook. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Um, actually, just in terms of submissions coming in, are you looking for? So for a filmmaker submitting a project, are you looking for them to be able to actually quite strongly show that they understand who their audience is? Definitely. And so for platform, and that would in, in, inform content and platform. And Definitely. I mean, without knowing, uh, having some sort of um, a st you know, strategic um, reach, it's not going to be competitive, mm. um, even if it's an amazing project. We definitely audience, pathway to audience is a criteria that we you know, put a lot of weight on, e equally to the creative, to be honest. Yeah. Is it Kylie, just in terms of how SPS reach the audience, do you have specific campaigns for each of them? Yeah, I mean, you you need to sort of do that grassroots stuff and thinking about the impact from the get-go as much as possible and work with relevant communities who have their own social networks and plans and audiences. Um, and also, all of our work, we, we, we have various outputs, so whether it be articles or videos or excerpts or trailers or all of this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, we work with all the different platforms at SBS, so whether it be the language groups or NACA or um, SBS Live or all of those platforms, we put it on, we put ads on on demand, we put them on TV, depending on, um, depending on what sort of support we can gather. But there's certainly that is part of the job. So it's not they're not mutually exclusive. It's definitely part of the job because you don't know, you don't know. So and certainly with our projects, because they're sort of statement documentaries, they go into these global awards. They go into a lot of awards, namely so that we can get those audiences. And so sometimes they get onto really important websites that a lot of people go to as reference points. So that's the boat. Like the boat got onto Best of Parallax of a certain year, and people use that as a reference point and then they share that and so um, 
yeah, you really have to think laterally and about the environment and where your audiences might be um, and how they can then find your work. Actually, Inda, you've mentioned that the Shooting Cats had a lot of PR in the US. Yeah, um, actually I forgot to show, I don't know if we still have time for it, but um, yeah, um, saying that you go you know, short form and online, even though there is a lot of competition out there, doesn't mean that it can't have that um, publicity or that impact. And um, um, if we've got time, I'll quickly... You can switch the screen. <laughs> I'll quickly show you um, some publicity breaks of just how um, how much it, how much that documentary did get people talking. Um, so that achieved my goal with what I wanted to do in documentary. So just from a 30-minute um, full-length documentary for Viceland um, in Australia um, itself, we um, got a lot of print from the West Australian Midwest Times. Um, which discussed the topic. Um, once again, Suede Pro, um, you know, something needs to be done about the feral cat issue. Um, online um, was another channel that we received a lot of um, PR on. Uh, we also got a lot of radio coverage. Um, I'll just go down here. You can see uh, on the online channels, um, so the Online um, clips were actually shown on Vice Australia and SBS Facebook, but then also shared. So the other great thing about online content and going onto these um, social media channels is the shareability. People are able to share them easily. You can give people a link and they can watch it in their own time, um, which, by the way, I forgot to mention, if you haven't seen it, um, it is available on um, SBS On Demand. Um, it's called Australia's War on Feral Cats, which is probably a bit more appealing to the um, more linear form, uh, uh, traditional TV audience. <laughs> um, but you can also watch it on, on, um, on YouTube as well. Uh, so, yeah, you can see that the comments, um, you know, they were, they were around about this 1,600 mark. Oops, what have I done here? Um, and they're always great, but it's also quite um, confronting reading people's reactions to your film. <laughs> it's exciting at the same time. Um, but as you can see, there's a few comments there and they tend to be quite positive, um, people understanding where he's coming from. And once again, I just, I'll just mention the um, Vice Channel um, did have a lot of more international um, audiences as well. So it was good to see that they, um, what they received from the um, documentary was that uh, they had a better understanding of the environmental environment and situation. Um, and then afterwards as well, um, I was happy to see the other week and whether or not my doco helped, you know, get the subject out there or whether it got people talking. It was great to see that just last week uh, the New York Times did an article on um, feral cats <coughs> as well as CNN and uh, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, achieved what I wanted to achieve just from an online doc. Any other questions? Yeah, just for Inde, um, <clears throat> did you shoot for the one by one aspect exclusively, or did you have sixteen by nine with a crop? No, everything was done in HD sixteen by nine, um, and uh, it, it was all from the one clip. But in the editing suite, you just you crop it then, yeah, yep, yep and you format it to one by one. Um, Want to keep it under what say about under fifty MB? And yeah. And did you find particular challenges in that post-process of still putting out a nice looking... Well, actually, um, it was Vice who actually cut down that one for me. Um, so their editing team and um, myself directing and um, giving feedback on the creative. Um, so it always helps when you've got the people working or the real editors and techs working on that yeah. post, post side. Thank you. Hi, my question is about repeat visitors to a, a browser-based experience. There's a BBC podcast documentary called Death in Ice Valley, which um, had a, a huge investigative audience that continued to interact with the material on social media. If you have a 
playable documentary that has that level of interactivity, which isn't just a one-off 10-minute experience, but people might potentially return to a story like that and continue to interact with it over time. Do we have any data or any information about audience behaviour that speaks to that kind of experience? Is that something that audiences are ready for? Should we let it go first? Um, so, so you're thinking also like of a serial example where that was playing out week by week and it got a huge amount of audience and the, the website was growing as the podcast was releasing. Right, the story's in some way open-ended. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that it's a resourcing question. So there are examples, like the New York Times have done a number of interactives where they've ongoing, like they've kept uploading content over time. So whether it was about soldiers that had died during um, I think the Afghani war, Afghanistan war. Um, but it's a resourcing thing. So when, the, the, when Gabriel Dance, the New York Times, was in Australia, he mentioned that he would never do that again because it's, it's, he's doing that for foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, something like the... <laughs> unfortunately. But um, something like Serial, that, feeds, that works within the body of the project and it makes sense within the content of the project by putting it out and having <coughs> that... Um, that user ge it's user-generated content in a sense, right? So you've got people con making conversations, giving leads. Um, there's no reason why it couldn't happen, absolutely. You could serialise a documentary over a period of time, and, but you'd be shooting something live, perhaps. <coughs> we did something like that with Exit Syria, where we had content coming out from the Satari refugee camp, and that was coming in daily. We were uploading that daily, and that was essentially like a blog form mm -hmm. at the time with, with three people's stories. Um, uh, she Called Me Red was live daily footage from the, from the Rohingya refugee camp in um, Bangladesh. So it's all possible. Uh, both of the both those examples from SBS point of view were, were for a short or for a limited period of time, like a three week period of time, um, and you build that resourcing into the production schedule. So potentially there's a like if it depends you, it's how you slice it, like how much pre production are you doing, how much production, and how how long does that extend for? Who's on the ground? Where's the material coming from? Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it. Whilst you're coming down, I'm going to just preempt it. I'm going to ask all of you uh, to come up with one online or interactive documentary before we're over. So you can think about that while that one's coming. Hi, thanks for a great panel. Um, I was just wondering, a lot of the docs that you've described are uh, advocacy-based or um, issues-based. I'm just wondering if there are any examples um, that come to mind. Do, do you think that uh, most of these forms are better suited to issues-based, um, impact-driven campaigns that can be kind of multi-platform and really um, work with that online, uh, the kind of the possibility to sort of um, refer people out to a million, you know, a million different hyperlinked possible courses of action, or um, I suppose this is a question in the commissioning space um, about other than art bites or including art bites, what else is going on that might be outside the kind of um, political or advocacy based sphere? It's a good question. I mean, they do lend it, you know, advocate, being able to prove that you have an audience, it does lend itself well if they have a, you know, if there is sort of some um, call to action, um, has an some sort of impact campaign. but. No, if it's still a good story, then from Screen Australia's position, I mean, uh, A Game of Three Halves is a good example. I mean, that's soccer history. It's a history project, essentially. So it's um, it's not, from my point of view, it's definitely, he, they were still able to prove that they had that audience fan base um, with that. So, yeah, it's, it's not a... I see what you mean, though, because most of the other ones we've funded. Now I think about them; they are, they, you know, they've got some sort of, um, um, yeah, some sort of issue really. And th that's if you think about it on social media, then it, it, to get people to engage with that, it, it definitely helps. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a straight answer. I mean, again, it comes to the, down to if it's a really great project and it has a really clear and distinctive pathway to an audience, then we would certainly. You know, take it, look at it pretty seriously. And also know your genre. Yeah, know your audience, know your genre, know, um, you know, and don't um, overstate it, like, be realistic. I mean, funding niche things is okay for us sometimes as well. On that list there, I don't know if you saw, but there was one um, that's uh, about the making of a horror film. And um, that application was really great because they knew their audience fan base. They're talking to iHorror, which apparently is this huge 
um, horror site. I've never heard of it. Um, and, but it has incredible reach, and um, that will get viewed. You know, it'll, it'll probably do really well. Um, so yeah, that's the key, I guess. Can I just pick up on that? I think that was a really interesting question, and. Um, I think part of the issue is that there's not a lot of funding available in Australia. So for example, you get a broader range of work coming out of the National Film Board in Canada um, that, that is not just issues based. So, um, you know, I think it's part of it is that people, um, you know, filmmakers have discovered, obviously, you know, over the last five to ten years they've discovered and really started to embrace and work with um, online as a distribution platform and leveraging the kind of social networks that does so well. But but um, I think there's also an issue in terms of just the overall pot of money that it, it that is available and you know and that's not that's not anyone here's fault, you know, it's like um, you know, it's just the reality that we're currently dealing with. But um, I think that does actually impact the range of work. And you can see when SBS, SBS is able to do a broader range of work, really, and some of it quite experimental, um, because it's got its own internal funding, although I'm sure. Which is you, tiny. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but, but I think just to your point, like, the, the, it's not just the theme, it has to be the story. So it's finding the story within the overall theme and it's the story that's going to win the hearts and minds of the audiences. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind. So that's how we differentiate ourselves from straight news. We're not news. We, As I said, we do that dance sometimes and we, if a topic is very... Um, contemporary or, or current or there's a lot of discourse around it, we can tap into it. But that's also strategic. Like We look for ways to... Um, embrace conversations that are going on so that we're not just in isolation sitting by ourselves and people aren't engaging with us. We That's part of the distribution strategy to look for key dates, key moments, what are the key themes and then <coughs> not piggyback but add to the conversation so it becomes a bigger conversation than just one project. So it's not it's not um, issue-based for the sake of being issue-based. We, we look at themes at SBS, but also we like to think, whether it's in the drama team or in the um, uh, documentary um, unscripted team, it is about the storytelling that's that what we're looking at, and that can persuade people more than facts often, you know, how a good story... So it still comes down to that sort of very seminal kernel of what you're trying to do as a filmmaker, which is a, you're a storyteller. Mm. Great question, I think. Mm -hmm. The last question I'm going to ask is one project that anyone in the room must see before... Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. Um, so, I'm going to start up there. Here with yourself, maybe? Oh, no, no. It's just so much wrong, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I've already plugged pretty much all of mine, but again, I'm going to say, go and watch um, Where the River Runs Red and The Guardian, and of course I'm going to plug Inde's film um, for uh, Shooting Cats and... Um, well, actually, watch everything that we've funded. I mean, they're just really good ones that I like. All of the Art Vibes projects, they're amazing. I love them. Um, all of the Doco 181s, say, you know, they're all pretty great. Um, and um, watch this space, because hopefully we'll have some really great new initiatives with um, an exciting online platform um, to announce in the new financial year. Mm, great. I've got, uh, Megan, one now. got one now. Yes, good. I've got one now. Um, if you haven't seen it already, you can look at it on your phone. You don't need to have a VR headset. Collisions, the net worth collisions, is really, really powerful work. It's quite short. It's only about fifteen minutes. And her new work, if oh, you ever get a chance Alabina. to see it, it's yeah. incredible. It's, yeah, uh, it was at the Courage Works for a while, and hopefully it'll yeah. circle back at some point. But. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'll go. I'll go boring mainstream. Well, it's not boring, but mainstream. Um, <laughs> if you haven't already um, won that war one. The Oscars this year for short um, online film, um, period, end of sentence. Yeah, um, it's good. Yeah, great movie. On Netflix. Great. Yeah, yes. Yes, yeah, so it's satisfied. <laughs> and it's interesting to see Netflix investing in short form as well. Um, got yeah. Short docs. Um, there's been a couple of short dramas that they've done, um, 13 minute episodes. So it, it's interesting to see if that uh, continues as a trend with them. It's an absolutely impossible question. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I would say look at all our projects and look at all the NFB's projects and look at all of Arte's projects, but just even bigger than that, I think it's just consume just consume things that are outside of your comfort zone and like and just explore that and look for, like, kernels and leads. And so whether it is on Netflix or if it's on demand or 
um, or if you're looking at the Guardian, just like go there and make sure that you see it. I mean, I think if you want to start, I mean, I saw Alma years ago, and that was when I was starting doing interactives, and that's um, um, it's an Arte thing, it's an mm. Arte project, but that was hugely impactful mm. for me. So, and it's really, really simple in terms of one person's point of view, um, but what you can do with the with the frame and how you can move through the frame in a really simple way. So, that's Alma, A L M A. Thank you very much. Well, look, I'd like to say thank you very much to our panel. And uh, the, the conversation can continue down at the Bavarian uh, bar. So if anyone wants to join us for a drink, we'll be down there for a quick chat. Thank you very much. Thank you.